Janusz. I'm uh, the head of mobile at Kupferberg. And I'm here to tell you how we measure the quality of our Android, Android code. And um, yeah, how we find the spots in our app that really, really need repackaging. Um, the first question is, um, what is code quality? Um, we some little, a little example. How, uh, who of you think that the, this one method on the right is uh, not a very well-written code? Okay. Um, and who of you had, knows that he has written bad code in the last year or month? <laughs> okay. And um, who of you uh, has, has an own Android app that he's developing? Okay. And in this app, is there a place that you know that you have to refactor it? <laughs> okay. Um, but do you, uh, who of you knows exactly which is the most important part to refactor? <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, for me, um, bad code is, um, has two, two very important parts. One is it's hard to read. And there's, uh, in the, the book where I took the example from, uh, the refactoring book from Martin Paula, there's an, uh, an, uh, a statement, everybody can write code that computer understand, but um, it's, yeah, it's harder to write code than that the humans understand. So bad code is yeah, hard for your teammates to understand. And that's the next part, if they don't understand it, changing it is really dangerous. So we have a lot of older apps where we have like yeah, some base activity, just has like 2,000 lines of code, and changing something in there mostly, or every time we change something, we know that there are side effects. But it, yeah, we, we just give it to the QA and say, hey, test this really good because we know there's, there is something broken in there. And um, that's the, the older apps that, uh, that we have. And yeah, then there's another part of, uh, um, of that code. When you look at it and say, aha, okay, I, I don't really like this. It's like this, this feeling that you have as a developer. Um, it's a feeling that comes from your experience with code. And, but it's, not, it's nothing that you can put into numbers or explain to new, uh, to new, to new junior developers or students that are working on your code base. And the part that I hate most about uh, the stuff that we make wrong in our apps um, is like it's mostly if the code is too long. So if you have a message that doesn't fit onto a screen or an activity that has more than 400 or 500 lines of code, um, if you have this, then you yeah, mostly break it up into smaller parts. Um, it's another a whole other talk to uh, how to do this properly. And um, another thing that I really dislike about all the Android samples uh, in, in the, uh, on the web is that you always have an activity and in the activity yeah, you just create an HTTP uh, um, client and then just start your HTTP call directly in the deep code. And everybody who starts working with Android just um, uh, um, accepts this and says, okay, I will just make the HTTP call here in my activity and handle all the error cases. And um, yeah, it's just routing the, the, the code. Yeah, that's the, the, the parts that I yeah, dislike the most in our code. Um, then, where does, where does bad code come from? That's the part that I, I've come up with. Um, the most important part for, for us to improve our code, code quality uh, was to, have, um, to, to um, have a mandatory code review in our workflow. Um, most of the time I said, yeah, okay, we need more, more testing and stuff like that to, to get rid of bugs. But it shows that having um, a code review before you, yeah, you really commit your changes solved a lot more problems and uh, made the code much more, more readable than, than most of the um, other, other steps that I thought would, would help. Um, yeah, then unexperienced developers. So if you have developers in your team that don't have the experience that the rest of the team have, uh, has and you just put them in there and say, hey, okay, here, do this, fix this, uh, uh, fix this box, implement the features, without guiding them properly, explaining them how, how you work in your company, or your code should look in your company. Then no guidelines. Um, I mean, um, bad code or good code, good code quality is mostly um, the stuff, yeah, that's, it, 
most of it cannot be put into, into really concrete words. So your team has to decide what you, what you want to, uh, what, what, what kind of code style you want to have, and what kind of code is good for you, what kind of code is bad for you, uh, for, your, for your company or for your team. And that should be put into some, some kind of guidelines that you, that all the other team members know, okay, this is what we decided um, that good code is for us. And then bad, bad priorities or uh, during development, so if good code or a good app that's maintainable and, and, uh, and well, well, uh, well built is not a high priority. Um, it's mostly the case with, uh, with customers, they don't care, they just, just want to product as fast as possible. And then they want all the fixes in there as fast as possible, and they don't understand that having the app built so fast made the app so unmaintainable that having all the fixes and new features in there is taking a really, really long time. So that's something that you have to you know, explain to the customers and negotiate with the customers and tell them, okay, if we spend a little bit more time now, then developing all the rest of the application later will be much, much faster. And then um, you probably notice if you start a new project, it really, really looks, uh, looks nice. It has a nice structure, nice architecture. All the classes are classes are really nice to look on. And then after half a year, it just a mess. Nobody knows how it's gotten from the good part to the bad part. So, the, I think is there somebody who can't agree to this? Okay. Um, yeah. And the problem is uh, with for us was um, where to start uh, with cleaning up the code. In our older projects, there's mostly you have a feeling like, okay, there's this one class, and I know if I change something in there, I will break the rest of the app. So you know, okay, you have to do something about this class. But that's that's all you have. To have. So maybe you uh, you're looking uh, like you're not knowing which part of the apps maybe need need some more refactoring. And then the next, the more important part is to make sure that the app doesn't get worse over time. So during your development, make sure that your app stays as clean as it was in the beginning. Okay. So the setup, I mean, the, in Android Studio, you have a very good code analysis, or, uh, analysis already. Uh, I want to talk about this. It's, that's something that you, you should all start with. Just run all the checks in Android Studio and see what, what, it, what it tells you about your code. Um, we um, yeah, do this on a regular basis. and. The, in the best case, before, it, uh, before every time you give something to peer review, you check it locally. Um, if you're working alone in a small project, that's yeah, most, mostly fine or mostly enough if it's a small side project. Um, for the big, bigger projects, um, we use the Jenkins build server. There are other good alternatives for Android. We, yeah, we have Jenkins build was the first that had good Android um, support. It's the Android emulator plugin, the Gradle plugin. Um, yeah, our whole setup is set up that every time we push something onto the development branch, it automatically gets built on the build server. And yeah, if the build is unstable, um, then uh, email or Slack notification gets sent out to all the developers. And the Jenkins will also do all the all the code checks that we have in place. So every time uh, a build is done, the, the code gets checked for for everything that we can check. So, what kind of tools are we using? Um, the first one is Mint. It should be obvious to every Android developer um, because the, the Android team does a really good job of putting um, Lint, uh, of creating Lint uh, rules for Android. So, if you're using Android, the Android SDK in a way that is not supposed to be used, the Lint rules will mostly tell you that. Uh, the Lint checks will most, mostly tell you that. Um, yeah, you can you can use it with Gradle. Um, you can disable some checks if you know why you are disabling them. Then you, sh you, you should disable them because it's only because then uh, you get only warnings that everybody ignores. And if you start ignoring a lot of warnings, then you will also ignore the important warnings. And Lint is something that you, um, Android Studio automatically does in the code check. So before you can check uh, before you check in your code, you can run the Lint check and see okay. What is uh, what? What kind of problems do I have in my in my app? Um, the, with Lint, uh, when, if you have if you have warnings, um, you we have we have in our our project has a lot of warnings that we ignore, um, but we know why we ignore them, 
and uh, we decide we actually decide to ignore them. Uh, so if you if you do this, then you uh, at least understand and a little bit better and know okay, uh, I can I could do these things, uh, but for now uh, they are not worth for us. And then if they, if you have high priority bug uh, warnings in um, in Lint, it's mostly bug like this one where you put in um, uh, an ID into the set color method and uh, the set color method of, um, more, uh, expects that this is a color and not just an integer. So this one would, uh, um, yeah, the, the color would be completely wrong. So, uh, that's setting you. so if you have high priority lit warnings, um, yeah, fix them as fast as possible. Um, only if you uh, if you have data, if you use a new data binding feature, then you may get a lot of uh, high priority warnings that are not really bugs because there's yeah the data binding is still in development, so they, they don't have uh, is completely integrated into the tools. The next part is testing. That's not a tool that is analyzing your source code like Lint, but it's yeah if you if your code is not tested, um, then you yeah you don't have uh, you can't get a good feeling about how, how it behaves. Um, there's uh, the Android team, Android two team has uh, a Jacobo integration mm -hmm. for code coverage. You can yeah, do this on the on, on the build server and just generate um, a statistic that says okay how much of our code is tested, which classes are maybe completely untested, which packages uh, are not really tested, and this gives you a, a little bit of a feeling how you stand with the uh, with the test. And also if a test fails, the build uh, should fail, and uh, you should yeah, just uh, send in developer an email and say, okay, fix this. Should be common, common sense in most most of the teams, I hope. Since the mobile development gets a little bit more grown up, testing is yeah, something I hope every team now does at least a little bit. Um, yeah, that's the, the benefits I mostly talked about. Um, then, then, if you have like um, a test coverage, uh, code coverage of 80%. It doesn't tell you anything about how good your tests really are. So make sure that you really understand what you uh, what and how you are testing, and that you often question if your tests are really good, and not just say, okay, we have a, a, a guideline that says no app um, um, can can be built that has um, less than 75% code coverage, because that does tell you nothing. I can run every code in my app. Without an assertion, without an assertion in my test, and I guess code coverage is really high, but it's not doing anything. So make sure that you really understand if you, uh, if you question or you test on a regular basis, and see if the um, if the tests do do something useful. Um, and if your tests fail, then um, check why they are failing, and um, see what this tells you about your code base. Because if you build something in part A of the of the, of the app. A test and part B of the app fail, then you know, okay, there's something that is not, that is connected, but it shouldn't be connected. And then you can then know um, another part that can refactor your, your application. Then that's, that's one of my favorites. Uh, my team doesn't really like me for that. Uh, I'm a little bit, um, maybe a little bit hard on them, uh, those uses sometimes. Um, that's check style. Um, the important part is the, this first one. Uh, don't go in there and say, okay, this is the check style, and if you're doing something wrong, then you are an idiot. Uh, the, the team has to decide on, uh, on, the, on the check uh, on the code style you want to use, and then implement it together. And check style um, runs on your Java code and tells you if everybody uh, follows the common guidelines. Like, um, we, for example, don't use the ternary operator for, for readability, uh, uh, um, for readability, we don't use uh, if clauses without brackets. Um, simple stuff like that that we decided to do as a team, and that checks out checks and says, okay, you just wrote something, or you have unused import. It's mostly very basic stuff. Um, that is, yeah. Um, you can also do it via Gradle. Um, you can build a nice uh, HTML report out of this. Uh, yeah. We are doing this on the on the build server and publishing the report for, for everybody to, to look at. But the most important part for me is um, to do it before um, you send code into the, into the review. 
So if I get code to review, I, I run some check files and see and check if there are a lot more uh, check style errors than uh, in, the, in the development branch. And if there are a lot of, uh, lot of check style errors, I just send it back and say, hey, fix the check style. Uh, I don't want to look at the small code parts that are not, at the brackets that are not in the right place. I want to review your structure and your architectural decisions and um, if, if your code is, yeah, fulfills the acceptance criteria, I don't want to be uh, to only look at the at the brackets uh, if they're in the right in the, the device, correct condition. Um, yeah, for me, the most important checks are, uh, checks are uh, length. So if classes are too long, if rests are too long, I yeah, that's one one personal <laughs> part. And then stuff like magic numbers. So if you have a lot of stuff in there that nobody really knows after two months what what it does, um, that's that's an important part of checks I can find for you. And duplicate code, most of the tools can find it. Uh, and the truth you can find it. If you have duplicate code, yeah, just be, re be, re be really sure that you need it and that there's no, no uh, way to get rid of it for faster development and faster faster uh, later on. Okay. Then another tool, PMD, also a code checker. It runs on the um, on your uh, compiled code, does static analysis, and it, yeah, just most of the part, uh, most of the times it shows you all the cases where you forget, forgot to think about edge cases. Um, um, yeah, you can also use this mailing. Uh, you can also let your build server create a, a create a report. Uh, I will put the slides up later, so if you really want to, to look at all the, the concrete where all the build, build, build file stuff, uh, you can do it there or just, just Google it. Um, with PMD, they have really, really uh, a big suite of tests uh, on, uh, on, and checks. So make sure that you know which one you are using, because if you have like 1,500 1, uh, uh, errors, then nobody will care if, if there are like five or six more. So just just put the rules in there that you want to use that you know why they are why they why, they, why this is best to do. Um, it's mostly stuff if you if you're returning from a final rework, for example, that's commonly you know uh, seen as a bad practice. Or if you're missing the finally and the stream is not closed, something like that, then uh, that this stuff that PMD can find for you. And um, yeah, be sure to build a rule set that the, that the team understands and that you um, that you all agree on and that doesn't produce a real, a, real, yeah, a real big amount of errors that nobody cares about. Okay, nine bucks, even more state code checks. Um, you, you don't need to use all the tools. Um, nine bucks is something that we don't use on a regular basis. It's more like a, uh, an addition to PMD and check style. It's basically integrated the same way. And uh, yeah, we use it. Uh, if we really, really want to be sure, then we sometimes run, run it, um, and um, yeah, we you could use it if you uh, don't have a, have a peer review available. So if you're working alone, then it is uh, it will help you a little bit more because it sometimes find, finds errors that other developers that look uh, look at your code will also find. And sometimes if we have a big code, uh, big code review. Um, we often work with subcontractors. Um, we don't be re review their code. Then we also use it just to see if they uh, if they have a bad habit that they, that they need to get rid of. Okay, those were mostly uh, those were common uh, um, Java analysis tools. There are some tools that are a little bit more uh, um, yeah tailored to Android. There's for example Lee Canary from, uh, from Square. Um, the tool that while your app is running finds um, uh, finds memory leaks and reports them. And um, we uh, also find there's, there's a simple service that you can create that uh, lets you um, that lets you define how to how to report these errors in a, a standard way. It's showing activity and saying hey there is a, a, leak, a leak in your app. But you can also uh, do it in your production version, for example, if you want to, or in a beta version, and uh, have it sent to you in the background or stuff like that. And it, this also helps you to find small, small memory leaks 
that don't cause the app to crash or the phone to get really, really slow, but they are nonetheless yeah, eating up memory um, in, the, in, the long, in the long run. Um, yeah, we integrated, we also integrated this in our build server. It's a little bit tricky because it finds the leaks while the app is used. So the build server is not really using the app. But uh, we are running um, the, um, our, our automated UI tests on a version that is using the kernel. So there are uh, some of the, uh, there are some memory leaks that we find in this way, some that we don't find. And uh, uh, some, sometimes we, uh, we also get memory leaks that are not really in the app, that are only there because the, uh, because the automated UI tests uh, have their um, yeah, just start an activity that's not started in this way in the, in the real app. So that's something that you want to consider if you want to do it, because it can get you if you errors that are not really errors, and that tends to make your team not really in anything that the server tells them. Um, yeah, this, uh, the, um, the memory leaks get exported as, J as a JUnit report to, uh, for all projects, and then the Jenkins just gives you a small graph and say, okay, there are like six, uh, six le uh, memory leaks that we found while you automated your IT system run. The next one, dex count. Um, also, a Gradle plugin. We, got, we just found it uh, some weeks ago. Really nice. Um, every time your app gets built, you have this uh, this nice uh, output at the end of your build. Um, if you want to, you can also. Um, we are we are currently trying to do this. You can grab this from the output from the build output and also put it in a, in a statistic on your on your build server because yeah we this. If, if you hit the memory, uh, the, hit the message limit in Android, who of you is using multi-dex for, for some of the apps? Okay, so the other ones are lucky at the moment. Uh, it's a little bit complicated, but the faster we get problem is that the compile time is very, very high. So if you have multi-dex, it's the fastest like one minute longer compile time if you multi-dex our apps. And one minute, if I compile my app 20 times a, uh, an hour or uh, 50 times an hour, it's like a two or three cup coffee breaks that I could make um, in this time. Um, yeah, it just says, okay, your this app is more or less safe until the client comes around and wants to put three more ad network, uh, ad network in there or a new tracking tool. But it yeah just can give you a feeling how how much libraries you have in there, how um, careful you have to be with adding new new stuff before you hit the, uh, the message. Message limit. Nothing is more is worse than hitting the message limit like two days before going to release your app and then going to all the multi deck stuff and yeah, your app is not, not really ready to be built to be built into a release uh, release version. Another model that yeah it's not really automated at the moment uh, at our our team is uh, the the great uh, the versions plugin. It gives you a new new graded task, dependency updates. And it just tells you, okay, your dependency are up to date. Uh, Android Studio will do this for you for all the Google dependencies. So if you're using an old version of this uh, of the app Comet library, then Android Studio will highlight it. But if you're using an old version of uh, Butterfly, for example, then you won't uh, won't realize this. And yeah, so sometimes you don't want to switch to the newest version all the time, but sometimes there's an important bug fix that you miss um, uh, that you miss, and then yeah. We just check this periodically, like the beginning of each sprint. We just run this one time and say, okay, is there anything you need to upgrade to? Is there anything you want to upgrade to? And then yeah, we're sure that we have the. So then um, the Jenkins plugin that uh, I really love is the, conti uh, uh, the continuous continuous integration game. Uh, it gives you it gives you levels of points and uh, removes points from the high score. If they um, do check star, uh, if they check in check star warnings, for example, for each new check star warning, they lose one point. For each failed fail test, they lose five points. For each test that is, for each new test that is passing, they get two points. Stuff like that. So you gain a little bit of a, yeah, it's it's a little bit of play 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 thing to do. Don't we don't take it very serious. Serious. Um, there's no, nothing like a like persons don't get even up if they get to like minus, minus 200 points or something like that. Because the, yeah, sometimes it, it, it happens that they break the build in a strange way and uh, they just lose all their, all their a lot of points. But it's, it's a fun way to look at this 
uh, and say, okay, I just got like 98 or 98 because I had this old, old project and uh, I refactored it a little bit during the bug fixing and got, got some warnings out or get it somewhat else. Then I, I said that we are automate a lot of this. Um, there are some technical uh, preconditions that you should keep in, uh, keep in mind if you, uh, if you do this. But also the most the more important part is the, the, to keep the team, um, yeah, to, to have this whole process understood in the team. So who of you is working in a team? Who of you is doing peer reviews on a regular basis? Okay. Yeah, that's, for me, uh, the, I mean, there are a lot of Android developers, freelancers, or, or people that are the only Android developer in a, in a company. Uh, so they won't ever get any feedback on their, on their code most of the time. They, yeah, they can learn a lot, they can come to conferences, they can, can do Google and read blogs, but they don't have somebody who sits beside them and says, okay, like, like you, you do this another way, or have you seen this nice, nice library? So the first thing is get a team that I would do. Um, if you don't have a team, see uh, how you how you can. If you're a freelancer, there are in I think in Vienna there's a group of freelancers that, that they are working together. So maybe say okay, if you if you hire me, you, there's a, uh, there's also you have also hired this guy for like a weekly uh, oversight. Um, if we work with our contractors. There's always one developer from our team that will check at least um, a half a day, half a day in every sprint. Check on their source code, check on their on their uh, on the way they they, they develop, check on their app, and just give give them feedback to improve their work. So if you don't have a, have a team, think about getting somebody who can who can help you with this. And then yeah, do do peer reviews. Um, we are using the Git flow model. Who knows what Git flow? Who is using it? This, yeah, it's basically for every new feature or bug that you uh, want to fix or implement, uh, you create a new branch, on, and before we uh, merge this branch back into, de into development, we always have a peer review. So every uh, every time a new uh, a new bug fix will go into the into the into the, the code that will will be released the next time we release. There's another developer who's looking at it, who's checking it. Um, and to talk to the other developer about the code, this, the, uh, what changes that are done. And yeah, this changed our code style a lot. It also changed the understanding of our app a lot. So you, you get to know the code, the code of the other people, you, you are able to fix bugs if the people get sick, they build this. And if you're doing this, really, really consider to do it. Yeah, and for us, um, almost a very important part is we have a manual testing team. That's something that everybody can, can have. Uh, it's mostly students that are uh, doing some defined test cases, but also um, authoritative testing that also help, help a lot to find bonus before we release uh, new versions. Also, always take the knowledge from the, from the steps back to the development. So if the manual tester finds something, and they find it in, all, in a lot of our apps, like Android, the first thing they have to do is they open the app, Look at it, and then we do this. And most of the time, if, they, if they have a, 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 if the junior developer builds it, it will crash at least after the second screen, time of the screen. And that's something that they then give back to the team, and the team knows, okay, this is the thing we really, really need to look into. And not only the, we don't only need to implement the features, we also have to turn the phone two or three times during the this, and yeah, then the next time they won't find this error. So always have a feedback loop for all the things, uh, all the things that are found. Okay, then um, a technical precondition, the, test have to, uh, the checks have to be fast, so if I check in something, and the Jenkins take like three, hour, three hours to, uh, to check if, if this is working, then I'm on a completely different task and I don't care if the Jenkins fails. But it, uh, for us, it, in good cases, our, our tests and checks run in, run in like the next six minutes, so Android is I would say okay, it's not, not as fast as I would, uh, would like to have it. And then we have a more more longer test period with automated tests. They take like 15 or 20 minutes, but after five minutes you know if you broke the build or not. And then you can go back and fix it. And if you have tests or checks that fail a lot or give you a lot of false positives, just remove them. 
If you have a test that always fails in every SSI, it's not that test again. Just run it, just, just run the build server manually uh, again, then the test will maybe pass, then just remove the test because it doesn't tell you anything about your app. It's just annoying all the, all the developers. And we'll also um, make the developers don't believe all the <coughs> tests or checks. So if, if, if a tool produces a lot of warnings, then just remove it and uh, say, okay, it's too much. It's not, uh, at the moment, not, not good for a team. And, and that will, yeah, if you have like five, five warnings, then you will look a lot more at these five warnings if, uh, than if you have like 600 warnings. Okay, in the team, I don't know who have seen this. Um, the, if, you, if you have a lot of these checks and you say, okay, you have, always, you have to always have zero warnings and you always have to, uh, you get, yeah, the people that are in the continuous integration game are top, the people in top three, we get a bonus every year or something like that. I mean, creating these points is really, really easy, really, really easy for a developer. I can just in, sneak in some warnings while the build is not running, and then after that I just fix them, and I'm, yeah, I'm the hero of the team. So <laughs> I make sure that your, that your team uh, is on board with all the checks. If the team doesn't like it, the checks, and you can't convince them to like them, then just don't do it. Because uh, trying to enforce this will only yeah, make them game, game this and say, okay, yeah, uh, they, they force me to do some stupid tests. We have this a lot with automotive uh, software. Um, they have like uh, their own checks after we consume the, uh, we give them the code. And they always find some strange stuff that say, okay, but the app is working, the app is working good. But say, no, no, it's, uh, we don't care if the app is working, but you need to fix this one. Yeah, okay, <laughs> we go back to this and yeah, we just work around their strange check and then we just we resubmit it and the app is working with it. Most of the time it's working with it. Um, so make sure that the test with the team really um, knows all the checks. Um, explain it to every new team member because if, you have, if your team is growing and after time there are so many new people that don't say, oh, that are just checks, but uh, it's not even the old guy's build, I don't care, then they're not and not doing anything for the team. And most important, if the team does not like it, like some of the checks, change them. The same is for the code style. The team uh, decides to, uh, that something in the code style doesn't fit their, their, uh, their needs anymore, just change it. Don't make it a strict rule that, um, that anybody has to follow. And I think that's the most important part, <laughs> uh, this will not help you to make a great app. Sometimes you have to meet certain deadlines. Sometimes you say, okay, I don't care about the quality of the app. I don't want, I only want to have a prototype, get it out to the users. And if they like the feature, then you will build it correctly. If you don't like it, they just throw it out. So always be sure that you know why you are doing those checks. If you're just doing them for some statistic, or because you don't know what to do with your time and just fixing your code style or stuff like that, then it's not worth anything for, uh, in the team. But if you have an app that is okay, it's an app that we, that we will support for the next three or four years, or if you have your own, your own project, uh, your own product in your company, we say, okay, this app is, yeah, I will work every day on this app, uh, and I will every day for the next, I don't know how many years, <laughs> then make sure that the, the, the checks can help you to yeah, always improve your app and prevent it, the, the code from, from decaying. Okay. Yeah, and always, uh, as I said, always be sure to know what is the most important part to do with your app. You could say, okay, I have to fix all these errors, but maybe there's an important feature that uh, will help your user, uh, will help your app to get more popular. Then always think about what is the, uh, the step that you want to want to do. Will you, do you want to yeah, gain the statistic or there's some feature that for now is more important than the statistic. So don't don't make the statistics your only thing to uh, to to measure the quality of your app. It's the code quality is not it has nothing to do with the quality of the, the app that's uh, in the in the play store. Okay, that's everything, and we have time for some questions. The slides are there already, so if you want to look at some of the plugins and stuff like that. Um, you can get them there. And if you're from Munich or Regensburg and you want to work in iOS or Android team, just, just talk to me or in our testing team.
just talk to me uh, during the day. The question was how do we separate uh, uh, the business logic from our UI logic. Um, the best part is if the business logic is allowed on the server, <laughs> because then uh, we don't need to repeat it in the iOS app. So that's the, the best setup that we move everything that has uh, that has some logic uh, in, uh, into it is moved to the server. The client is just displaying information to the server. That's the best case. If you can achieve this, I would certainly go for this direction because it saves a lot of time. Um, because we don't need to implement the code exactly the same in every client. Um, yeah, then uh, we use um, yeah, a mixture of, uh, of MVP and uh, MM, MVM or something like that. Uh, so we have, um, we have in an activity, um, we have um, controllers for every block in the activity. Uh, and those are only only for the view. So the activity uh, is, is only uh, is only um, only concerned about view and only about instantiating those those controllers. And then there's a separate part of controllers that yeah, just uh, talks to the server or something like that. Um, yeah, it's more or less basic basic stuff. Um, just make sure that every class has, a, has its own simple uh, single concern. Uh, and yeah, we we using. Um, Dagger, I did with it and stuff like that to, to make easy to configure everything. And, um, so it's, yeah, and, and, and Eric's Java has a lot to, um, to split up stuff and, and make it easy to, to for example, chain uh, HTTP code. And so regarding the UI testing, yeah. can you test yeah. At the moment, um, our uh, automated UI tests, uh, they are done by the QA team. They are uh, working with Appium because that allows us to write the same tests for iOS and Android and reuse them. So the, the UI testing is completely is a, compl is a completely different sub-module in our apps. It's the app developers not actively really work on. So we have to yeah, it's a little bit separate teams or separate uh, roles in our team. And uh, so we don't have anything like either an espresso test in our uh, in there. Um, most of the um, times we run all the tests on the emulator. Uh, so that's, that's something that we're working on. If we want to uh, go that we uh, make possible that we have tests that only run in JUnit, because that yeah, reduces test times for us. Yeah. And one problem we project we checked uh, with, it was like two minutes and 30 min uh, seconds with the on the emulator with repackaging and starting the emulator um, in a clean build and um, the JUnit tests, if they would run without the emulator, was like 24 seconds. So that's something we're working on at the moment, but it's, yeah, it's taking a lot of discipline to encapsulate everything from Android away from, from, the, from the logic. So in some, in some cases we have, we have um, code that is like just a wrapper around the resources. It gives you a string or gives you the current time from your Android device. It allows us to mock this uh, for test, but only very, very important parts of the app. We want the uh, app logic and say, okay, this has to be tested correctly. For, for example, time zones in some apps is a real problem uh, to check if the time zones are correct. Um, of course, the, the app client may be in a different time zone in the server and stuff like that. Um, and there we have um, yeah, we try to, to mock the base for the Android stuff and have a wrapper about every class that needs the Android job. But it's a lot of code that is maybe not worth writing. So we don't we don't really have a good answer for this at the moment. Okay, more questions? Yeah. You mentioned the problem with the multiplex. Yeah. So uh, did you try to use the profile to mm -hmm. yeah, we, the yeah, we have we have some apps that uh, that where ProGuard allows us to stay below the uh, below the, uh, the method limit. Um, but we also have a lot of apps that are using Dagger 1, and that basically means you have an exclude of all your classes. <laughs> so Multidex is, uh, so uh, the pro program is not really removing anything, except from the li from some of the libraries, but most of the libraries also come with a do not exclude everything. <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, with Dagger 2 it gets, hopefully it gets bad, better for, for, for our code, uh, but yeah, most of the time, uh, 
for us, program doesn't have uh, doesn't work to was using it because it yeah, makes it, it, it often seem more complex, it throws more problems than it solves for us. And the code is not that important that you can pirate it, so we don't we don't need to uh, to uh, obfuscate it. Okay, more questions? Okay, then thank you, and I hope the pizza uh, the lunch arrived already. Thank you.